Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Sue Gardner, Executive Director of the Wikimedia Foundation. The Wikimedia Foundation is the nonprofit behind Wikipedia, the world's largest and most popular encyclopedia, which is free to use and free of advertising. Wikipedia contains more than 20 million volunteered authored articles in over 280 languages and is visited by half a billion people every month, making it the number five most popular web property in the world. Since her arrival at Wikimedia in 2007, Sue has relocated the organization to San Francisco and has facilitated dramatic growth in annual revenues to fund an infrastructure build-out and development of new capabilities and free knowledge products. Sue has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Sue, for joining us today. Happy to be with you, Mark. So we last spoke in 2009 in front of the camera, and so much has happened since then. In the last five years, this organization has really developed in a phenomenal way, in a way that perhaps nobody could have imagined. But let's go back to the day you walked through the door at Wikimedia. What did you find? Uh, so, it, yeah, it was 2007. It was June of 2007, and I had just taken the job, and at the time, I think the agreement that I had with the Board of Trustees was I was going to run it for six months, and then we were going to figure out what kind of shape we were in and what we wanted to do after that, because I needed to get my head around what it was, right? And so, yeah, I turned up in St. Petersburg in Florida, which is a very small town. A lot of Canadians go there to retire. And uh, the office was in a kind of a strip mall, something called the Executive Suites. So you were located at that time, where, where were you located? In St. Petersburg. I, I was in Toronto, but I came to St. Petersburg, So you flew Florida. down from Toronto, yeah. down to St. Petersburg. <clears throat> yeah, and at the time I think the staff was about four or five or maybe six people. It was four or five in, in, uh, in St. Pete. And we had a crappy little office with like an ugly sofa and, you know, like there was no decor to speak of and the decor that there was was kind of ratty. Yeah, that's what it was like. And, and so you walk in there and, and there are a few people uh, working at, at this place. But even at that time in 2007, this was an organization that was driving the one of the great web properties. Yeah, at the time we were the number nine most popular site in the world. Today we're number five. We were number nine, and what had happened was Wikipedia launched in 2001, Wikimedia Foundation launched in 2003. Around about 2006, Wikipedia started getting incredibly popular and surpassing CNN and the New York Times and the BBC and all the big ma major kind of news media information sites. But the organization behind it, and this was the big challenge, right? The organization behind it had not at all done anything to keep pace with the growth of Wikipedia readership, right? And the infrastructure was beginning to totter on, yeah, on the yeah. brink of and, falling over. Yeah, and we were extremely lucky because we had a couple of incredibly uh, talented technical volunteers, and then there were three engineering staff that we had, and they were incredibly talented too. So we were very, very lucky. Um, it was amazing, really. Like, if you look back, if you think about it, um, that small a group of people maintaining a site of that size is absurd. It was ridiculous. The fact that it was up at all is, is a testimony to their awesomeness. Talk about how the decision was made that St. Petersburg was not going to be the center of operations for the Wikimedia Foundation going forward. Yeah, when, when, I, when I joined, um, I, I, there were two things that I wanted to know from the board. And one was, um, I wanted to know how wedded they were to the idea of having a very, very small staff. Because at the time, a lot of their descriptions of the staff on the website were like fewer than 10 people, right? Extremely small staff. And I was like, if you want an extremely small staff, I probably am not going to do that with you, right? Because it would feel very exposed and vulnerable, right? Because you couldn't competently you do can't the scale. thing without it. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to know was uh, how wedded are you to St. Petersburg, Florida, right? Um, they were in St. Petersburg because Jimmy was living down there when he started Wikipedia, and so that's where he founded the thing. Um, and they had been lucky because uh, in people who were very important in the early days of the foundation, like Brian Vibber, had been willing to move to Florida uh, for them, mm -hmm. right? But clearly Florida was not a place that they could stay. And so the board agreed with both of those questions that I had. And Florida wasn't a place f uh, to, to stay, or at least St. Petersburg wasn't a place to stay, because the number of people who had the expertise at the cutting edge of technology development 
uh, in St. Petersburg were, were, was very constrained. Yeah, that was the major reason for the move, was engineering talent in the Bay Area. There were other sort of secondary reasons. I mean, Florida, uh, St. Petersburg is very, very small, and so getting world-class PR services and world-class design services and so forth is harder than it is in a larger place. Right. And then also travel, traveling down to St. Petersburg is hard, traveling somewhere like San Francisco major cities easier, right? And so it enabled us to be more freely international and able to move around the world. But the main issue, obviously, was the engineering talent. And so, yeah, the board was in favor of both those things. And we ran a process. I was not the ED yet, right? So I was not in a decision-making role. I was in a supporting the board role. But we ran a process. We looked at uh, DC and Boston and New York. And I think we looked at London, even though it was highly unlikely that we were going to leave the United States. But as an exercise, we looked at London as well and at San Francisco. But San Francisco was sort of the leading contender from the beginning and, and did turn out to be the place that we went for the obvious reason of the engineering talent. And then you came here. You set up an office, um, and, and uh, in those days, and, and all the way through to today, it looks very much like an incubated uh, uh, startup with mm -hmm. um, very configurable workspaces, mm -hmm. uh, people uh, really focused on what they're doing, uh, but also um, very much of, of team collaboration mm -hmm. uh, that, that goes on. So you go from having a budget of 79000 then what happened in terms of how the organization scaled in terms of both staff and expense to support your, your scaling of the, uh, of the facility? Yeah, so the first thing that an ED should do and needs to do is figure out the money, right? And so I came in, <clears throat> figured out how many bank accounts were there, what was in them, what do we owe, what do we have, and, uh, and it was pretty clear that we were going to want and need to make more money to support the organization growing in the way that it needed to grow. And so that was my first order of business was like figure out the revenues, right? Um, we had a good model, which was that we put up banners around um, in the winter, in November, December, every year, and just asked people to voluntarily donate, and they did, right? So that was great. So our our expectation was that we might just optimize that. But as a kind of diligence exercise, we also wanted to try other things and sort of just experiment for a couple of years. So we did some experimentation in uh, major gifts. We got some uh, grants from foundations, both restricted grants and unrestricted grants. And we did a little bit of what in nonprofit land is called earned income. So we did right. a little bit of business development as well, right? And after two years, what we determined was we could have taken any of those paths. They all would have provided the money that we needed to get our work done. Um, but <clears throat> we chose the, what we call the many small donors model, which is the annual campaign. We chose that model because it was the right one ideologically for us, right? So when you get your money from major donors, there's, uh, there's the potential for drift towards their personal interests, what they want to do with the platform, et cetera. The same is true for foundations. They have their mission, they have their goal, and so you risk getting pulled it off your path onto their path. And there were some pretty tempting discussions uh, in, in those early days with people who were interested in writing big checks, but sure. those checks coming with either strings attached in terms of board involvement or, or, or other types of We never uh, had a really, really hard decision to make. We never had anybody offer us money to do something um, we never had anybody offer us money to do something in particular. We were lucky, right? So we never had to make a tough call. Um, and we did decide early that we would take money. You know, a lot of nonprofits won't take money from what they consider to be bad boy donors. And we decided early that that was not going to be a criterion for us. We would reserve the right to turn down a donation from anybody for any reason. Um, but we weren't going to systematically exclude a particular kind of person or a person with a particular kind of background. Because honestly, like we felt like we're pretty iconoclastic, right? We have our own value set. We don't necessarily buy into other people's values, other institutions' values. And so we didn't want to put in place rigid rules about what was okay or not okay. But you also didn't take Google up on their yeah. offer to host your entire uh, site and your entire infrastructure. There have been lots of offers for folks to give us various forms of in-kind donations or to do different kinds of business deals with us. Um, and we, we try to stay away um, from over dependency on anybody else, and we also try to stay away from um, deals that pull us off our path, right? So we did experiment with business development earned income for a couple of years, and we could have made a lot of money, obviously, um, but we did not want to get in the habit of um, becoming a different kind of organization that was more commercially oriented, more right. oriented towards commercial partners, right? So the many small donors model was perfect because it 
forced us, like where your money comes from is what you pay attention to. And it forced us to pay attention to our readers because they were the ones funding us. And so they write us a check and they say, oh, by the way, I wish that you would do the printer friendly version a little bit differently. And we're like, okay, we'll look at that. So it was good, right? Because it aligned um, our purpose and our mission and our beneficiaries with the cash, which just meant that there was no, there, there was no difficulty anywhere. It just made everything right. really easy. And, and how, how large are the checks that are written? They're very small. <laughs> so uh, $30 average donation. Um, I think the biggest individual contribution we've ever gotten is a, a million dollars from uh, Pavel Durov, who's the founder of Kontake, the Russian Facebook, the Russian version of face Facebook. Um, but the smallest ones, I mean, one of my favorite donations is from a, a little English girl who persuaded her parents to let her send us five pounds, which was her allowance, right? I like when we get five pounds because I think it keeps us kind of frugal and it keeps us conscious of the donor's money, right? If little kids are sending us their cash, we're gonna try and be really careful with it. And, and your, your budget as you've scaled has scaled tremendously. You don't get to half a billion unique visitors on a global scale with the infrastructure that you had back in 2000 and Six. Yeah. Uh, so where are you this year? Next year we're going to spend 55 million. Next year. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and what we spend the money on is two things really. We spend it on technology because that's what we are. We're a website. We buy and install servers and we pay the bandwidth bill and we build new functionality. Resilience, backup, security, yep. all but also, that. But also functionality, right? Functionality. Interface, design, um, building new features for editors, building new features for readers, just making the website as good Network as we possibly bandwidth, can. all that stuff. Yep. That's most of the money. That's about 70% of the money. And then um, the remainder of the money goes on the normal things, accountants and lawyers and so forth. And also we do some grant making, and this is really unusual. It's not ordinary for a company to be both a technology company and a grant making institution, but we give out grants about $10 million a year to other Wikimedia organizations and to individuals. So that's everything from, you know, we might give you know a fairly large amount of money to Wikimedia Deutschland, for example, for their programmatic activities, and we might give you know fifty bucks to someone to offset the cost of printing flyers for a conference or to buy a camera for some purpose. Um, uh, Twenty million contributors mm -hmm. and uh, and one hundred and fifty staff, um, chapters around the world. Um, you are organized in a particular way, uh, just as any organization would be. Uh, to fulfill the promise of your mission. Talk about how your 150 staff divide into various functions. How do sure. you actually manage the organization? Yeah, and so so the bulk of the staff is engineers, right? And so it's, it's a wide range of different technology positions. Um, the ordinary ones, right, like user experience people, data analysts, um, coders, front-end developers, all of that, right? Unusually, in our engineering department, we also have a couple of positions that we call community liaison which is people whose job is to talk to editors, right? So if we're building a new page triage tool, obviously we're gonna to talk to editors about how do they use what's already there? How is it working for them? What would they like to be different or better? So that's probably 70% of the staff, roughly. And then we have, um, <clears throat> we have um, other groups that do other kinds of work. So we have a small legal team that legally, you know, provides legal defense for the projects newly recently has started also providing legal support for volunteers who get um, threatened with lawsuits in the course of their work and we have a fund for that. Um, we have the ordinary, you know, we have accountants and we have people who do media relations and, you know, the sort of normal Human resources, yeah, that kind that of stuff. Yeah, administration, all of that. Um, and, uh, and then we have the grant making team as well. So the grant making team is more international than the rest of the organization, not surprising because we give out money internationally, right? And they are very close to the Wikipedia community and spend lots of time talking to volunteers and so forth. Every, every department actually within the Wikimedia Foundation um, has a connection to the community which is very different from other departments connections based on the nature of their work, right? So if you work in features engineering, you're talking to new page patrollers and you're talking to editors and uploaders to commons. If you work in grant making, you're talking with the volunteers who are more interested in um, movement governance, right, and organizational work, outreach work. So all quite different. So it's a very interesting time for you now to choose to step away. Yeah, so um, 
it was, you know, you know, you know so, so when you run a thing, you're kind of always constantly evaluating, like, where am I at my trajectory with this thing? How long am I going to be here, right? Um, six years is a long time. It's been six years. And so, you know, at a couple points over the years, I'd sort of think, now, how am I feeling? Where am I at, right? Um, and the balance uh, started to tip towards me leaving, I think, with a number of kind of um, moments in our history. The first one being a long time ago, the first one I think was 2008. So essentially, Wikipedia has experienced over the years a number of attempts to censor it, right? Um, some are successful, obviously, like we're censored in China, obviously, like everybody. Um, we are also censored in places where, um, or, or, or there are attempts to censor us, um, in places where we don't think of as being highly censorious regimes, right? And so in 2008, um, uh, the, Wikimedia, the Wikimedia Foundation was attempted to be censored by a thing called the Internet Watch Foundation, which is a, um, a coalition, it's a, it's a group of retired police officers who uh, were put together by a coalition of ISPs who presumably did not want to be regulated by the UK government, and so they did some self-regulation. And they found on Wikipedia uh, an album cover, it's a violent, heavy metal um, image, and, you know, I don't think it's particularly tasteful, whatever, right? Uh, but Wikipedia was censored by the Internet Watch Foundation to remove people's access to that image in a way that accidentally also made it impossible for anybody to edit the Wikimedia projects in the United Kingdom, right, who used these service providers. So there was a huge outcry. They, in the end, were forced to back down. What they said when they backed down was something like this. They said, we still believe that that image is child pornography. We still believe that that image should not be available to be seen. But Wikipedia is, has public opinion on its side, and we cannot fight Wikipedia, so we're going to back down. And that was the first incident for me where I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And the fact that they backed down because it was Wikipedia was the first kind of disturbing note for me. So over the years since, people have tried to censor us a bunch of times. Um, typically, most, uh, most of the attempts fail. They fail because we have a good legal department. They fail because of a bunch of things. But I think that they, the real reason that they fail is because Wikipedia is a behemoth, right? It's what the Internet Watch Foundation said. People like Wikipedia. Public opinion is on their side. So people can't get away with censoring us in the same way that they can, like, Joe's website down the street right. who nobody's ever heard of, right? And so I've been thinking about that a lot, and I've been thinking about the, the, the shape that the internet is taking and the direction in which it's going. And I see all kinds of um, trends that I find enormously disturbing when I think about, I'm old enough, as you are, to remember life before the internet. Right. And it was not as good, <laughs> right? Like the internet is an awesome tool that has made people's lives transformatively better. We're in the middle of a golden age of access to information, even though the journalists are very upset because they're not sure what their business model is gonna be. For the news consumer, the information consumer, it's the best period ever in human history, obviously. And I worry that we risk losing that. And I worry that we risk losing it for a whole bunch of different reasons. Governments beginning to assert authority over the internet and sort of reinstating national boundaries that for a while seem to be kind of melting away a little bit. Um, you know, commercialization and private sector groups, private sector organizations wielding enormous power and not really being accountable um, for the decisions that they're making. Why not stay at Wikimedia and act in this uh, playing field uh, over the next several years. I think what I began to believe was that in that environment, Wikipedia is actually fine. I'm not worried about Wikipedia. What I'm worried about is um, the future Wikipedias, right? The sites that someone like Jimmy Wales is gonna f create something somewhere like St. Petersburg, Florida, it's never gonna get off the ground because of a variety of pressures, the way the internet is developing, it's just not gonna be possible, right? Um, I'm not saying that that is true. I'm saying that's what I worry about, right? And so it felt like to me, so, so we fought against SOPA um, at the Wikimedia Foundation, and it was enormously fulfilling. What SOPA would have done was, it was an attempt to um, support the rights of people who own copyright, right, and make it more possible for them to, to sort of defend their position and make money from copyrights that they owned. But it did that at the expense of everybody else. So essentially what it did was it privileged the rights of copyright owners over the rights of everybody else, including the people who write Wikipedia, who want to just create material and share it on the internet. So, so we blacked out Wikipedia um, for 24 hours. 
which was terrific, and a lot of other sites did similar things, Reddit and a bunch of places. Um, and that was a really important moment for the Wikimedia movement because it was, I think, the moment when Wikipedia in some ways found its voice because all these people built it, it earned all this goodwill, and then it used that goodwill to say, oh, by the way, you might want to pay attention to this problem and phone your elected representative, right? right? And so that was great. Um, after that, at the Wikimedia Foundation, we had a conversation about SOPA and all the various threats that we could see on the horizon in various ways. And ultimately, we decided that even though we are ideologically committed to a free and open internet, it is not the job of the Wikimedia Foundation to actively work towards that as part of our core mission work. It's just true, right? And what I found myself thinking was, you know, I want to do that work, right? I am, like I said before, like I, I remember what it was like before the internet. I know how important it is. I know how much it matters. I understand both what its original promise was when you know it was first in development and what it could be for us and I see the gap between what it is becoming and what we originally hoped that it would be. And I want that fixed, right? Because I think it's such a powerful thing. It would be criminal to squander it. It would be it would be absurd. And so that's what I want to work towards. And so I thought to myself, you know, do I really want to do that? What would that look like? And I thought, uh, I think Wikipedia is in great shape. Like when I think about where it is now versus where it is when I came. Oh my goodness. Where the, yeah, where the <laughs> Wikimedia Foundation is now versus where it was when I came. And I, 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 it is stable and it is competent and it is good, right? It's solid. When I came in, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation was precarious, right? Like it, it needed someone to come it in. It had no management team. It, it had, it had yeah. no governance standards. It, 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 it was just broken in a whole variety of ways, right? And then I look at it now, and I, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a good, strong executive management team. The board is in very, very good shape, right? Well, it'll be so interesting to see how you take your next steps into advancing this idea of free knowledge and free access. Mm -hmm. Sue Gardner, uh, you and the team and the volunteers and the community have accomplished so much that have benefited us all. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your contribution and thank you for your insights. Thank you.